You're listening to the Ones Ready Podcast, a team of Air Force Special Operators forged in combat with over 70 years of combined operational experience, as well as a decade of selection instructor experience. If you're tired of settling and you want to do something you truly believe in, you're in the right place. Now here's your host, former prep course ops superintendent and current special reconnaissance training guru, Trent Segmiller. Hey everyone, and welcome back to another Ones Ready Podcast. You're in the team room. I know what you're thinking. Uh, Trent's going to mess up another intro. And the truth of the matter is, I, I do mess them up, but it's because I'm excited. I get excited every time we get to come in here. We get to talk to another amazing person. I get to learn something. I get to get better at something. And um, it wouldn't be possible without all of you out there uh, listening, subscribing, liking, leaving us uh, comments and reviews. And we really appreciate it. And speaking of people that we appreciate, um, we have friends that happen to be companies. And we talk to them. They help us out. Actually, this podcast would not have been uh, possible, this episode, uh, without one of those companies. That company is Everly Stock. Uh, so you can go to onesready.com, check out the companies that we're affiliated with, put in the Ones Ready code, get yourself a sweet discount. Uh, this episode is going to drop after Christmas. So if you boloed Christmas, go ahead, jump in there, get them something nice, and uh, make up for it, and do yourself proud. So this episode is, um, I think... We've officially made it now that we have a Navy SEAL on the podcast. I don't know fact, if that's an yeah, official thing or not. The fact that he even agreed to come on is a big win in my book. Like, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Trent, that was the best intro you've ever done. And even if this thing goes down in flames, I think we can say that we've we've arrived. <laughs> my whole workout today, all I thought about was the intro. Like, this is a full day in the making. Um, so our, our guest today is uh, Mr. Terry Huyen. Uh, Huyen. Man, I messed hey. it up even after I wrote it down. We're so cl- we even talked about, about, about it. it. We talked yeah. about it right before we uh, started. Former Navy SEAL, and I don't want to steal too much of his thunder because obviously I don't know what I'm talking about. So, uh, <laughs> uh, Terry, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Welcome to the podcast. Uh, I mean, thanks for having me on, guys. And, and, and just a caveat, I love my Air Force guys. So we're, we're all we're all good here. Uh, so a little bit of my background. I mean, I uh, so I joined the Navy right out of high school. Came from a, a little town here in north northern Indiana. Grew up in the uh, Midwest, kind of dairy farm and farming world. So I joined right out of high school and spent 26 years in, uh, in the SEAL teams doing a little bit of everything. And, you know, 17 a year, 17 of those at the National Mission Force with, with Development Group, where I got to work with quite a few of you guys. And then I uh, kind of wrapped it up with our Bud's Prep, which kind of coincided with you guys building out your, uh, your prep course for the Air Force side. So I I was able to to share some of our lessons learned with you guys and help you build that out. So it's good. I'm glad to be here. Awesome. Yeah. Right. Sorry. Go ahead, bro. And so kind of as uh, a Trent was kind of alluding to and everything, you have a ton of experience um, and our purpose for this podcast and a lot of the other ones that we're doing, you know, like with rescue swimmers and everything like that, we want guys to have their entire, you know, full on hundred percent. This is the job that I want to do. These are the things that I like about it. And this is at least, you know, a little bit more percentage than we knew stepping into it of what to expect and what to kind of think from the job, you know, uh, Navy SEALs, obviously super popular. You guys have done some awesome stuff out there. Um, so what would you say, I know there's movies and all that kind of stuff about Navy SEALs, but what would you say kind of in your own words and what you would no- want all the listeners to know as they're trying to make their decision, um, you know, to go ASPEC war or Navy SEALs, whatever else, um, what would you want them to know about what a Navy SEAL does? Uh, well, first off, I'd say any, anybody that's willing to put themselves out there for the special operations community, whether it's Air Force or Navy or Army or even the Marine guys now is good on you. You can't, you can't make a bad choice on, on any of the four. I'd say what sets us apart is we are uh, a little bit different because we are uniquely set up to run unilateral operations by ourselves, or we can you know bring in our partners, partners. And I, I say partners within special operations. So we can, we can do operations with army. We can do operations with air force. I mean, we take air force guys with us on just about every operation these days, you know, especially our PJs and our CCT guys. So I would say what sets us apart is we have a uh, very robust team nature. So especially at uh, Damnick, once hopefully that my message didn't pop through there. I'm on that computer. 
Especially no, at the you're, development you're group. good. Yeah, we, we, can, we can see all of your messages and we're going to go ahead and post them in the yeah, YouTube. Good. So yeah, congratulations. <laughs> well, good. Yeah, maybe I'll get, a, I'll, I'll get some sales for Redcon with that one. But uh, I would say, you know, the, the fact that where we come from, you know, once you get through the crucible of Buds and Hell Week and graduating and getting to try it and then going to a team for five years and then screening for damn Nick, by the time you get to the operational level where, where I was at for a number of years, you set the bar at a certain level that everybody you work with, you can count on them to do everything they need to do. So when we you know, bring you guys up for the 24th, it's we do training, but it's not a training that I got to prove that the 24th guys know what they're doing. We just plug them in. Hey, we're getting ready to go deploy. Here's what we're doing. You guys know how to do your job. So it's, it's at a very high level kind of varsity level type operations and and you guys plug right in when we when we get our army guys from CAG they plug right in so it's uh it's unique in that aspect I guess. Okay. That and my then question. for I got my, my dog here he's he's, he's all over me. <laughs> yeah it's all good. Um so as far as the, the big differences between you know Air Force Special Warfare, um the big things are if you know we're kind of augmenting the people that like you guys, as you guys are a unilateral force and, um, any other big differences between the mission of AFSPEC war and NASPEC war that you would want the listeners to know? Uh, I would say probably the biggest difference is, is on the AFSOC side, you guys get the best of both worlds. So you augment us on the Navy side, but then you, you also augment the army guys. So you get to see both sides of it. So you're getting, the best of both worlds when you guys deploy with us. So, so it's, I mean, I've, I've got my own little world in, inside of NSW that, that I love and, and I cherish, and this is kind of what we do, but you guys get the bridge gap. So you get to see us, you get to see the army guys, you get to see a little bit of everything and kind of take the gleam, the best of both worlds. I can't count how many times you know, like our CCT and PJ guys would come up and we'd start training on whatever it's going to be. And they'd be like, Hey, here, let's try this. You know, here's something we learned with our guys down south. Let's try this. And it was awesome. Right. Uh, super beneficial for a team to just have cross flow um, over different services and just new ideas because, yeah, a lot of times people get stuck in like, oh, this is just how we do it every single time yeah. when, you know, that might not be the right uh, fit for whatever kind of puzzle you're trying to unlock. Um, so, you know, we hear a lot about the SEAL team and, you know, all that kind of stuff. What does a, an actual SEAL team look like as far as, you know, different jobs within there? Like you said, you're a unilateral force. So not everybody is the person, you know, kicking down doors and they kind of portray that as, you know, every single person is exactly the same or whatever. But what are the different jobs that you guys have um, and what does a, a SEAL team actually look like? Uh, so to generalize it, so a normal SEAL team will have a number of platoons and inside of the platoons you'll have – Anywhere from 16 to 20 guys in a, in a platoon. Two platoons make up a task unit, and a task unit will actually typically deploy together. So inside of those platoons, you'll have SEALs, which you know everybody has the same baseline going across. They can all jump and dive and, and do everything along those lines. But then you'll have specialized guys inside of that. So you'll have somebody that's a breacher. You'll have two or three of those guys that are specialized, and their job is to get the door open or get the gate open and through that. Then you'll have snipers and you'll have uh, lead climbers and you'll kind of break it off. So everybody's kind of a jack of all trades. And then some guys will pop up here and there for their, for their specialties, whether it's jumping or tandem jumping or, or any of those aspects inside of that. That's a little bit different than, uh, than maybe some of our army counterparts or our Marine counterparts is we train across the board for everything. Yeah, that's awesome. We, I mean, obviously, you know, we, we do the exact same thing. I think that's why we've always worked, you know, so well together. I've always, it's, it's one of those funny things. Like we always joke about, you know, the different tribes and stuff, but if you put like 10 of us in a room, like I always hang out with like the seal dudes a little bit more. I was, a uh, I'm a proud graduate of the PLC out on the West coast. So I, I got to go to the, uh, to the PLC in 2015. So I spent some time out there on the, uh, on the silver strand of beautiful Coronado <laughs> Island. Yeah. So it wasn't a bad gig. It was awesome. I, I'd love my time there. And, uh, that was probably the best military course I ever took. So it was cool. We got to see the, uh, you know, we got to see buds. We got to see you guys on the grinder. And luckily I was just going to class cause I was an old PJ. I had no, I had no desire to go get in the cold surf. <laughs> so <laughs> I think that would have been a short one for me, but 
when uh so you were a pre 9-11 guy right so you had 27 years in so that means you know you saw peace time and then you, you transitioned over so back in that you know i'm assuming like late mid to late 90s what what caught your eye what made you want to be a seal so i actually enlisted in the early 90s so 92 is when i joined the navy so it was, I was giving you too much credit you look like a younger man <laughs> I know. It's, I think it's the, the beard that hides all the wrinkles. The, the miles haven't caught up yet. But uh, it, it really, so coming from a small town, I had you know, three choices. I could either go to college, which I was not mature enough to go to college at that time. I could stay in my little town and work and you know do what the other guys do and probably end up in a dead-end job or join the military. So growing up, I was a swimmer. So I loved the water. So I went to talk to the Navy guy about being a diver. And at this point, I had no idea what SEALs were or anything about the SEALs. This was prior to Al Gore inventing the internet and all that good stuff. Right. Yeah. <laughs> You'd have to look into your uh, Encyclopedia Britannica in order to look this stuff oh, up. Oh, yeah. 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 So, he, so I went and talked to him and he showed me a picture. He's like, you know, asked me the questions like, what do you like to do? Shoot guns and everything else. I'm like, hell yeah. It's like, you like blowing stuff up? I'm like, of course, man. We're, I've never done <laughs> Shit, it. It sounds don't. awesome, right? Yeah. Who don't? So he shows me to go to the jungles of that <laughs> Predator movie. Yeah. It shows me the big picture and, you know, the guys climbing out of the water and jumping out of airplanes. I'm like, hell yeah, sign me up for that. He failed to mention that, you know, 85% of our guys drop out and what happens to <laughs> well, the guys yeah. after they drop out. So, yeah. Never tell me yeah. the odds. Yeah. So, so I signed up for it and went to boot camp. And then, uh, yeah, boot camp's when I actually met. My first real seals and that those are the guys down in boot camp doing a coordinator job started working out with them and asking them questions and they were explaining the reality of what i signed up for so my eyes eyes wide open and kind of dedicated myself like hey this is what i signed up for so i've, I've got to do it because you know 19 i don't think i have another choice because this is you know where i put my name at right that's kind of cool that those seals like took it sounded like they took you under your wing and showed you the ropes a little bit or at least kind of said you know hey kid here's here's what you're getting into how did you value that mentorship do you think that transferred over to kind of you know to form what you're doing now yeah i think so because their whole their whole role was to get guys into the pipeline you know this is before buds prep and, and a lot of the stuff we have now so they knew that to get the right candidates in and, and to be in the right shape to show up out there they had to do their job which was you know, to get guys ready and be the, the first represent representative of NSW for us in boot camp. Yeah, so those guys were good. And you know, I ate it up everything they would tell me. I would spend extra hours there. There's like two or three other guys in the company that were who were in the same path as I am. So we you know we'd show up at four thirty, do workouts with them, hang out, ask questions, you know, clean the decks and take out the trash and any anyway, value any moment we could get with them to kind of glean whatever they could give us. Yeah. What were your, before you got in and before you even talked to these seals, so we had, you know, the, the misconceptions that you had that you, you probably slowly realized you were like, wow, I was way off on that. Did you have like <laughs> one crystallized thing where you're just like, man, I was completely wrong on what I thought this was going to be. Yeah. You know, probably like when I showed up to San Diego, like when I show up there, then you actually see firsthand the grind that these guys are going into. I mean, they're wet and sandy and running and you getting yelled at and working their ass off for probably 20 hours a day. So it's like, holy shit, what did I, what did I sign up for? Yeah, exactly. Like I'm, I'm rethinking this decision. Yeah. Yeah. But there's at that point, it's like, where am I going to go? Cause often a distance across <laughs> right, the bay, yeah. you can see the ships. Yeah. Like, well, uh -huh. I don't want to go over there and, and cream, clean shitters and spray paint. So <laughs> yeah. I yeah. can either suck it up and do the work now or, you know, go live that life. And I didn't want to do that. 100%. So did you, did you ever consider going to the air force? Was that even a talk? Did you ever talk to a recruiter or? No. And it, my uncle was in the air force, air force, but I didn't really know enough about it other than it was the air force. I knew there's different branches sure. and I, I liked the water. So I was going to go to the water. Got it. Yeah. So Look, that's awesome. Yeah. Looking back now, I mean, you guys definitely have a much easier life. Oh, hurtful. <laughs> and also, <laughs> also true. Also, also true. Yeah. I'm, yeah. Barracks. <laughs> Do you mean the Airbnb? Because it's gorgeous. <laughs> you guys got great golf. The Air Force course. Lodge. Are you referring yeah. to that? Yeah. What is this? Is this place only four stars? This is garbage. Get yeah, me out of here. Your recruiting program is awesome. Yeah. We're, we're doing a pretty good job. But I, I wanted to just touch on that that point that you made when you first got to San Diego, though, that, that moment of, of truth where you realized exactly what you were getting yourself into. And I think a lot of candidates show up to their selection course or going through the prep course, and they, they tend to think that they're the only person that's having doubts or, yeah. is, or, or is feeling that fear or anxiety, you know? Um, 
and and that's one of the things that we always at least i always try to tell them like everybody's feeling the same thing we all just mask it in a little bit of a different way um mm-hmm. if that if that tracks yeah, absolutely. And, and that's one of the things when I, when I went back up at the end of my career to the prep program and could, could kind of see from, you know, knowing, you know, hindsight's 2020 is like, okay, 26 years. I know what these guys are signing up for. I know what they're asking, what, what they're getting into. So that, that kind of formed my role of being more of a mentor to the younger, younger guys coming in and explaining, okay, here's the process. Here's what you're actually signed up for. You know, take all the all the fluff away from it. Take all the shininess away from it. Here's what we're going to ask you to do. Here's where you're going to go if you make it through. You know, X, Y, and Z. There's there's no in betweens of, of of this. You know, the reality of what they're signed up for. So that was beneficial from having me up there and and some of the other guys to explain it to them. Because what I was seeing is there was a, not a lot of, uh, for lack of a better term, personal accountability and responsibility. In uh, any kids coming up, you know, they would be awesome athletes and great candidates, but they would be kind of screwballs because they've never really been held accountable for their actions before. So, you know, kind of teaching them about that. You know, when, when you go out and you're 19 and you get busted for drinking out in town, you're going to get dropped. That's just, you know, there's no black and white. You're a candidate right now. You know? So it's, it was, it was, uh, I don't know, for, for, for lack of better better terms, it was it was eye opening for me to see where these guys were and, and kind of be a father figure, you know. Right. Yep. As as well as kind of like holding them accountable and, and being the master chief. Yeah, we've yeah we we've talked about that before, Trent. You know, we've talked about it here on the show is like having to get used to students again. Like we all have all worked these jobs where like later in our career we kind of reoriented to the younger guys. So we definitely feel that pain. Go ahead, Trent. I'm sorry. I, and it's it's weird that that for some of these people it's the first time in their life that they've ever had that that definite line in the sand you know like if you cross this line there's no coming back like your parents can't call the teacher and 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 save you you're like it's over like you're going to the fleet or you're going to the regular air force or you're out like you're and it, and it's crazy but uh, let let's get back a little bit back towards uh towards prep or, or preparing for buds uh, what was it that you were doing because uh, obviously you were successful what what kind of stuff were you doing to prepare for that. Oh, I would not uh, classify myself as <laughs> as being well prepared for it. I mean, I we did the runs, we did the workouts with the guys in boot camp, and then when I went to A school, I kind of kept it up. But luckily for me, when I showed up for San Diego, I got voluntold to go out to San Clemente Island to help with third phase, where they're doing their land warfare and everything else. So I was out there as a kind of a gopher, go take care of the crap and and clean the chitters and do all the stuff that nobody else wanted to do. But what that did, that bought me time. So when I came back from that, uh, class 188 was already classed up. So I, I got rolled into the next class immediately, which gave me the time. And, and what we at that time was our fourth phase. So it gave me like like five weeks of doing O courses and running around with boats and practicing log PT and doing beach runs and everything else. Because I, I probably was not even ready for it at that time. Right. Yeah. And is the is the selection course is buds like purely physical or do they look at uh, attributes or any of the other stuff? Like how do they determine who is the right person? Who who is you know the right person to be a seal in essence? Well, we're we're always kind of kind of gathering all the intel we can. So we're looking at physical attributes, right? So they have to have, have tests that they have to pass or fail. You know, if they, if they don't pass them, regardless of how good they are as a person, they can't pass because we have standards, right? Then we're also looking at character, you know, the, their character traits, you know, integrity, loyalty, how they work as a team. So we've got what we call a baseball card. So every student as they go through has a baseball card and they're getting ranked and rated by all the instructors as they go through. So if there is a question and a, you know, a potential candidate has issues with a physical test, we can look at those baseball cards and see where they are. Like, Hey, is this, this kid have all the attributes that we want. He, yes, he's he's got strong. He's strong on integrity. He's strong on teamwork. He's strong on on all these aspects we're looking at. He just worked weak on maybe his runs or his soft sand runs or something. Right. We'll take those in account into account when we're counseling him, which may may run into a uh, maybe we give another shot at the run, or maybe we'll roll him into another class and give him another shot. So yes, we are testing on certain aspects, but we're we're categorizing everything and taking a metric on everything. 
Right. So, but being that that person of character and being a good teammate and all that other stuff, that's kind of like the the difference between oh, getting yeah. a second chance at that run or like Cadre's just waiting to get rid of you. You fail that run, and like five minutes later, you're packed up and you're out of there. Oh by yeah, one, I mean, by one millisecond. If you were slow on that <laughs> run and you're a douchebag, yeah. you were you were oh. getting no love. Yeah, I mean, there's there's kids I dropped for that that had integrity issues. They just weren't honest and team focused type type guys and you know once they failed something that was that was the opportunity to to move them on to uh the position in navy where they could mature and potentially come back later on right well and the next thing is I, i've seen a few videos of it but i want to get your personal per- perspective you know like what did it feel like when you got selected uh what i mean I, how do they even do it do they walk you all out you know like We've heard a few stories from like the Green Beret side of the house, but how do you find out that you are getting the Trident? Uh, so, well, when I did it in the early nineties, it was, you graduate buds, then you went to jump school and then you went to, at that point I went to Silting four. And then once you're there, you go through what we called SST at the time. Now it's all one big pipeline. So at that point, all of the guys on the East coast went through, you know, we did more jumping, more shooting, more demo. And then at the end of that point, I was at my, uh, what we call probation period. And I got in my platoon and it was up to my platoon at that point to test me, to do all the certifications for me and they give me my board. So it was, it was very, I'd say very intimate because the guys that were judging me are the guys that have been working with me for several months to, to say yes or yes or no, this guy has what we're looking for. And granted it, it's, I won't say it's a given at the time because you still had to perform but unless you mess it up, you were you were going to go through the process. But you know, nowadays it's it's much different. Now you go through your buds program. It's and the whole pipeline is 60, 63 weeks from the time they step in the door until they get their trident. If they don't get hurt or mess up along the ways, so that's sixty three weeks. And at the end of that, they get their trident before they can go to their team. So right. that, so that kind of that rite of passage that I that I, I experienced with the hazing and everything else that kind of goes through that that bonding and building experience that crucible of of getting your trident is missing to a point. But I I think we're getting much better candidates at the end. They just have a longer pipeline to go through to you know to show their moxie to the team. Right, and I think that's probably like also a consistency thing. You know depending on whatever team you go to, you know, obviously you're going to be trained up to a certain level, but there's Mm -hmm. a certain attitude that goes into each different team, but that is a cool concept to be able to actually like from the cradle kind of nurture your own, you know, little baby, (laughs) uh, guy that's coming out of the pipeline and, uh, grow them up into what you exactly what you want for this team. Um, so you're talking about the pipeline a little bit, and I just want to get back into that because, you know, for us, you have to go through certain courses and that kind of stuff in order to become, you know, a PJ and put on the break, go to your team or whatever. Um, but for you guys, do you guys have any specific schools that you have to go to, or is it based on your team that you're at? Um, you know, free fall, uh, airborne, all that kind of stuff. What does it look like for a guy that he's done, he graduates and he's selected from the, uh, selection and then he moves on. What happens after that? Yeah. So once, once a guy graduates buds and gets his trident, you know, through the whole selection process. Now they've already got all their, all their basics. So they've got their jumping and their free fall and their halo and, and, and everything else. So now they show up to the team. And then once they get to the team, that's where the specialty schools, you know, depend on the cycle. You know, if the team's deployed, the new guys will go to schools. If the team's in workup, they'll just jump right in the workup and then do the schools later on. But that's where they'll get their sniper school or comm school or, or anything else. Uh, pending, uh, except for the uh, medical guys, our our SOTMs or SOCOMs, I think is what we're calling them now, they'll leave buds and go straight to their to their medical school before they go to their team. Okay, are there any uh, high attrition points after you're done with you know buds in the pipeline, or is it kind of just you know once you're a responsible adult and you do your work, pretty much everybody else gets to do. You don't get any DUIs and you do everything else right, then you're you're pretty much somewhat guaranteed yeah i would say what's once you get through basically hell week and first phase of of the buds pipeline that's where we kind of the attrition rate really kind of steadies off because once you get in diving we'll lose some guys for water confiscacy and, and comfortability in the water you know if they can do that we'll lose a few people in, in our land warfare phase which is third phase 
you know, safety issues or something else, but not too many of them. And then through the pipeline, we'll still have some attrition, but not the big numbers we do through uh, through first phase in Hell Week. Those are the those are the big ones. Okay. And anything that you specifically struggled with, you know, after you're done with buds or in the pipeline or any of that kind of stuff that you might want to give a heads up to to study or check out before <laughs> other guys are I was, going through? I would say my hardest part, because, I mean, you can't tell on camera because I look awesome, but I'm short. So, <laughs> so being at five, six, trying to do soft sand runs with the, the six foot instructors was probably the hardest, hardest part of for me. I was always sure. in the goon squad getting extra attention. Well, they say selection favors a small guy. So did that actually work out to your, to your benefit, at least the selection? Well, I, I didn't get hurt, which is good because I was small enough that I was low enough to the ground and everything was compact. <laughs> so that low center gravity. Yeah. yeah. It's like, it's like trying to hurt a fire hydrant. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. You know, outside of those, you know, struggling with the runs, I, I think I did pretty well. You know, I was, I was a swimmer naturally. So the water was kind of my safe space. They could yell all they want. They couldn't really do anything to me, but, yep. uh, yeah, and, and the oak horse is fun. Logs are fun. As long as you got a good team, I, you know, being a short guy, we had the Smurf crew. So we, you know, the Smurf crew guys <laughs> right. and then the tall guys kind of had the constants. Everything in right. between, as guys would quit, they would kind of shift around. So their <laughs> teammates, always, yeah, they had, would always you had shift. Your own you know? little tribe, yeah, yeah. We had our little tribe. You know, we'd move one or two here and there, but most <laughs> of the time, it was the same guys all the way through. That's awesome. Yeah. So getting your trident, I mean, I'm hearing a lot of the same, like your story sounds a lot like mine. Like I'm a, I'm a Midwest guy as well. I, I have the same sort of story for the air force. I was just like, Hey, I want to do this. And uh, I heard about this cool job and didn't really necessarily, uh, didn't really necessarily know that's where it ends though. Cause it sounds like you're an accomplished, uh, war hero and I'm a dork. So that's, that's the, <laughs> the main difference we're rocking there. But what just, was just the first, timing? <laughs> what was the first time where you really thought to yourself, like, I'm a damn Navy seal. Like I've made it. Do, do you remember having that moment? Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, putting, putting a pin and trident on is very satisfying because at this point it's probably a year and a half into the training cycle by the time you go through buds and then show up to the team and then do your SDT and then do work up with the platoon, you know, back then in the nineties. So it was very satisfying. Like, okay, now I'm accepted. You know, I'm part of the tribe. They accepted me and they, we did their little hazing and, and everything else. And now I'm part of the crew. So, that, you know, that was very satisfying. And then after that, it's just it's a job. You know, you show up every day and everybody's the same and you, you do your work and uh, do what the nation asks you to do. We get this question every single day, every time we have a guest, every time we put any sort of post that says, ask us a question. The number one question that we get is, so what do you do day to day if you're a Navy SEAL and you're not getting ready to go deploy? So what did you do day to day when you first got to those teams? It, probably the same thing you guys do. So we would show up. Our daily routine would be uh, you know, PT on usually on your own unless we had a, a command PT or something going on. So you know PT until you know seven to nine or so. Take a shower, go check out the platoon space, and start your workup cycle. You know, if we're local, we're either doing air ops stuff or range stuff or shooting guns or you know, working on something. There's always, there's always something to do in the, in that cycle. I mean, you guys know that as well as anybody else until you, cause the ultimate goal is to deploy and do your job deployment, whether that's peacetime in the nineties, like I did in South America, or nowadays you're, when you deploy, you're going to war. So you gotta be ready. So you're always, you're always there sharpening the sword, getting ready to go. Yeah, absolutely. And then back in the, the back in that day, you know, we're going to talk about, you know, your deployments in, in a second. So we're not going to uh, I'm not going to hit that hit that up too much now. But how did the training cycle change? Like, how did that day to day change pre 9-11 and kind of, you know, post 9-11? Like, I, I imagine the roof had to have blown off of your respective platoon space when 9-11 happened because you guys knew that you guys were going out the door shortly after. Yeah, so I, I would think for us it was uh, I was already at, at development group at that point, so I got over there in '98 and spent a couple times in a squad or a couple years in a squad, and I was in a sniper shack, and we were actually on standby when uh, when 9/11 happened. Oh wow, okay. Yeah, so you know, so immediately you know we're in the gym working out when when the towers got hit and people started going off and, and reacting, and you know at that point our primary responsibility on standby is to be ready for hostage rescue or something else you know the balloon goes up around the world we got to be ready to go so that's what we were there for so when that happened you know we immediately expected something to go on 
you know, it, it took a couple of weeks before anybody reacted and, and started sending people into Afghanistan. At that point, it was one of the other squadrons that got to go, but it, uh, it significantly changed. So going from kind of being prepared for the, uh, for the zero 300, you know, when the balloon balloon pops kind of thing to active day-to-day combat in a, in a mountainous area that we're, we're not probably weren't really prepared for honestly getting into. So we had a lot to learn, but uh, what was nice is at that point, our, our command was very small and you know, we had you guys up there with us. We had constant feedback. So when one squadron was overseas, we would get the feedback day to day on what they're doing, what they're planning for, what went right, what went wrong on missions, what gear was working, what gear wasn't working. So we were in a constant learning cycle for that first couple of years. So as, as a, you know, as the squadron's over, they're feeding it back. The next squadron is prepping and is that constant feedback over turn. And, you know, at that point we were doing 90 day deployments, I think, you know, and then, uh, so it was, you know, one, two deployments a year sometimes. And just, you know, our, our level and that kind of that ramp just was through the roof on learning what we were getting into. That's great. Like, I can't even, I like to talk to pre nine eleven guys. Cause I think it's just fascinating like that. You know, because I most of us will never understand what it was like before, and then just to hit that that wall of like, hey, now we're at war a hundred percent of the time, ready, set, go, and you guys already have like, yeah, zero all this to background just right away. <laughs> you know, yeah, that's that's insane. Um, but let's go back to uh, if you don't mind, like your first deployment. Uh, well, first I want to ask you, what was your your specialty? Did you get one of those specialty schools like sniper or uh, or Sockham or anything like that? Well, once you got on team. Uh, when I was at team four, I did, uh, you know, with my background in outdoors, I wanted to go to sniper school. So that was one of the, I got that after my second deployment. So I, got, I was a sniper comm guy and a couple of other, some air off stuff, but those, those were the ones that like, sniper was kind of the one I really jumped into. I did some breaching. So when I was in the assault side of the squadron, I was breacher slash heavy weapons guy. And then I transitioned into snipers just before that summer before nine 11, so when the towers got hit, I was I was in our recce shack with our sniper guys. So that was, that's where I was at. That's crazy. And and your your first deployment ever, you know, like I think everybody <laughs> has like those those memories of that first time ever deploying. Uh, I think you said it was it's South America, and 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 what was what was that like? Yes, yeah, so I did. I did two deployments in South America, and that was you know obviously pre nine eleven, so mid nineties. We were doing a lot of uh, MTTs or FID, which is Foreign Internal Defense. You know, we would fly in Ecuador, spend, you know, three, four weeks down there with their special forces guy, training them on with his Marop stuff, you know, Hilo stuff, whatever it was, just kind of getting them spun up and doing a lot of training with our foreign partners. That's, that's really what my first two deployments were, which is great, you know, coming, you know, as a young guy, you know, bouncing around South America, learning what it is to be a SEAL in, in teams, getting experience doing the different type of operations that we do. So prior to 9-11, I, you know, by the time that hit, I'd already been in for nine years or so. So I was, I had a pretty good base before, you know, the bullets started flying. Can can you tell us where you went for the first one after 9-11 or ish? Well, right after 9-11, I, we did a Balkans tour for, uh, for our squadron. You know, one of the other squadrons took Afghanistan. We took the Balkans. We we're still doing the, the, uh, the mission there. And then my first trip into what I would call true combat zones, Afghanistan in the summer of O2. Oh, man. I, I, was like that a shock? Like a shock I mean, I, I, mean I, just, I, just, I don't understand. I don't understand. Like you know, the, like the, the, the from the moment I joined, like, hey, it was like, hey, you're going to Iraq, Iraq or Afghanistan. Or Afghanistan. This is what it's, this like. Is what it's like. And everybody on team with me had already, had already been, there. been there. You know, but you guys, but you guys didn't, didn't have as much of that. You had that feedback loop, but like, what was the difference like between like a South America deployment versus the first stand deployment? Well, they got real quick with us. So I came in and we took over from, well, from the green guys, but after, Right. and all that stuff it already happened so we knew guys were going to get right. killed right we'd already lost guys over there we'd already had real combat not my myself particularly but the other guys so when we landed and and got ready to do our job you know the reality of what we were getting into was already there there was no you know glorified hey i'm here i'm going to be cool i'm going to kick indoors and do this stuff it's very real at this point because you know some of our friends did not come back already right i mean yeah it's a it's a sobering experience right to to understand what's all gone before. Um, and then uh, obviously I think uh, you had a, a fair number of rotations at that unit. And uh, I just want to 
kind of walk through the rest of your career. And, you know, like, I don't want to ask too many questions that puts you in a, a weird spot. <laughs> yeah. um, but then you, you did go back to Bud's as an instructor, right? And, and then to the prep, or was it just the prep course? Uh, just the prep course. Yeah, so I did uh, end up doing 17 years there at, at Development Group. Uh, part of those with, with some of the Salt Squadron and some of our specialty stuff. But, uh, yeah, after I did, uh, oh, man, what did I do? Did Afghanistan, and I went to Iraq, back to Afghanistan once or twice, and then back to Iraq. Did a few more Afghanistan. So I don't know. It did quite a few trips over there. Right. Uh, all and every one of them was kind of different, you know, different years, different situation, what's going on. You know, at, at the beginning we were, you know, as a national mission force, we were kind of limited to, Hey, the top five guys. And then there's like two or three others that we'll go after. And then outside of that, we don't do anything. And then Iraq hit and we were going chem bio and we were doing, you know, nightly hits in Iraq. So that kind of very, what did our appetite quite a bit for, for more operations. So then we got back to Afghanistan and we were going after just about anything we could find. And then it got into a lot of just, Hey, be there, show yourself. And then it was kind of a weird time in 0405 in Afghanistan. There wasn't a whole lot going on, but, uh, but then Iraq got really, got really hot and like 05 with IEDs and, and green got really busy and they started inviting us back. And so we started sharing, sharing deployments. So our 06, 07, 08 deployments, we would kind of share like half the guys would go to one place, half the guys would go to another place and, and kept really busy. Like my 07, 07 deployment to Iraq was probably my best from a, like just straight up work, work type deployment, which is a lot of fun, but uh, yeah, that was good. So something that's kind of hard to explain the, the work and fun aspect of, of certain yeah. things, I think. Yeah. Um, well, you, we you, all, train yeah. So, you, you train so long for, to do the job that when you don't get to do it, it's, it gets a little aggravating. You got that itch. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you absolutely. get the itch. So it's like, we're really good at doing X, Y, and Z and you know, DAs and taking out bad guys and, you know, breaking down networks and understanding networks. And you know, we got so good at it. It was frustrating when you didn't have a target. It's like we would have in that 07, we had a target every single night that we could fly. Right. I think there were, I mean, there were a lot of teams that are doing a lot of stuff at the yeah. time. It was, oh yeah, we were, we were doing nuts. a lot of good work. So I actually have a, a question that's not on the paper. I don't know if oh. you want to answer this. Uh, I didn't read between it anyway, so you're good. Uh, you guys and the green guys, like, what is the level of professional smack talk that goes on between those two uh, units? Oh, it's, it's up there. Just, I mean, just like you guys, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll talk trash to everybody. Absolutely. And it's, it's funny because, you know, at the beginning, you know, it was very, very competitive because the jobs are so few and far between in like a one or two or three, but then it got to be like, there's so much work that we couldn't do it all. So we were asking them for help. They'd ask us for help. And then it just turned into just good banter. Right. It, uh, that's awesome. And then, uh, like, I mean, uh, that kind of just leaves me like, after doing all this, what, what drove you to, to get out of the Navy? You know, like what <laughs> I'm old, it seemed like you were having a great time. <laughs> yeah. He retired because of T M B baby, too many birthdays. He was gone. <laughs> yeah. At, at the end of it. So when I, when I finished my job at, at Chicago at the prep school, I'd already been in for 26 and some change. Wow. So I had two options, you know, one was retire or two go back you know, move the family again and go back and maybe do one more job before I kind of timed out at 30, you know, and, and the move for the kids was a lot harder than I thought it was going to be because they grew up in Virginia. So moving them from there, even though they were excited for it, it was, it was pretty tough. So at that point they'd already made new friends and kind of sports and school and they're teenagers now. So I, I figured it was, it was time for me to kind of give up my, uh, my career and, and move on. Cause I couldn't keep up with the young guys anyway. Well, you gotta, you gotta stop chasing that dragon at some point. You have to divest yeah, yeah. yourself from, cause it is addicting, man, being on the road and oh, being TDY. Yeah. And like, I was lucky enough. So I was a, an operation superintendent at my last job at the schoolhouse. And I weaseled myself into a troop chief position <laughs> up here. So I've been, I've been right back onto that day-to-day -day grind of even, even right now, like I have like five performance reports that I have to like do like tonight. Cause of course it's always a, a short suspense on everything, but I, I do like the the day to day. It does get sort of almost addicting being on the road and going from school to school and honing your skills with the with the bros. So, um, but it sounds like you good. You made a good transition. What are you uh, What are you doing now? What do you find yourself uh, passionate about these days, especially with that whole career behind you? Uh, I quickly realized that that my position in life was not 
made to uh, like sit behind a desk and do nine to five jobs for, for somebody else. After you know, two and a half decades, I, I really valued my time, uh, time with family, time with friends and time to make my own schedule over everything. So I started my own company and what I do is consult with uh, businesses on leadership and teamwork development because they are lacking on any kind of plan to develop leaders uh, or develop develop their team inside the community and their companies. So I do that. I also coach youth athletes and then uh, on the outdoor side and is how we, how we connected through Everly Stock. I'm on a pro staff with quite a few companies and just kind of help them mostly from a friend standpoint that I've, that I've built over the years. And then uh, Redcon One, it's a supplement company. I kind of help build out their, their outdoor slash tactical side by, you know, just the, the Mr. Olympia type guys. Shout out to all stay busy. McBride. Yeah. What up, Mike McBride? Shout out. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure he's he's waiting for this one. (laughs) I bet he was. Um, So what's your overall goal then? So, you know, here on, here on the podcast, we, we got together and, you know, it was, it was really about getting that information out there to make sure that everybody can act, make their, you know, best informed decision. And then, you know, overall we want people to be successful and it doesn't matter if those, if those people end up choosing seal, we would love to steal some of your recruiting. I'm gonna tell you straight up. <laughs> like I, I want it to be a hard choice between, you know, aspect war and Navy special warfare. So yeah. what, what's your overall goal? What are you, what are you trying to do with all of your, cause that's a lot of interest, man. And it sounds like you're engaging with goodness. So what would you say your goal is? Uh, so what I realized is, after I retired, I needed to find a new purpose because, you know, when you're in the military, you know, you've got hey, whatever my nation, my nation needs in a deployed status, whether it's combat or whatever it is, and then take care of my team and then take care of kind of like myself and family. So once those, those guys are gone, I've got to restructure how I look at, you know, where I, where I put my priorities. So I kind of had to reprioritize, you know, my mission, which now is really uh, how do I leverage my experiences and my knowledge to help everybody else be better. So I, I really kind of embrace that role of being a mentor slash coach. I, I, I really enjoy making or at least helping people become better. So that's, that's my mission now, you know, whether it's a youth athlete or it's businesses or, or just helping friends in the industry. Yeah. Outstanding, man. That's awesome. And and again, I, we connect with that, that you we're on that same sort of wavelength there. So Break it down for us, Barney style. Thirty second elevator pitch, <laughs> right? So somebody, somebody I'm comes terrible to you. At this. I know somebody comes to you and they go, "Okay, what type of people do well in the seals? What type of people are you looking for?" And try to do it in a way that it makes NSW unique. Because we always have people like, "Well, I want to be in the Air Force. I want to be in the Navy. I'm not sure yet. I'm making this decision." If you had to sell somebody a candidate, say. If you like these things, you should come to us because this is what we do on the teams and this is who we're looking for. How would that resonate or how would that sound with that candidate? All right. Well, first of all, none of us should have to sell what this lifestyle is, right? So this this is a you calling, think, right? This right. is a calling. Yep. Uh, I would say if you're going to look at being in the SEAL or even AFSOC, your, your primary focus or primary characteristics are going to be a very humble, selfless servant type person that's always looking to uh, lift up their team before themselves. Does that, does that work for you? I mean, it's, it's probably Perfect. less than 15 seconds, but crushed it. Yeah. Yeah. hundred yeah, percent. E- egos don't go anywhere. That's exactly. Um, that's like the know, first quarter. What we're looking for, uh, for pretty much any successful team. I think, you yeah. know, like you said, you've been uh, trying to translating this experience that you have into the civilian world and everyone else that's out there and trying to make them the best and what they need to be. And I find, you know, I just transitioned out of be- becoming or being a PJ to doing the PA world. And I'm trying to spread that culture just the same way, like you were, you're talking about, you know, across the network. And then right now I work in a med group, which is very difficult for me to do. <laughs> like you were talking about just sitting in, in an office right now, but that's how much I owe the air force uh, before I can move on and back to special operations. So in my, in my time there, you know, my job is to make sure that I spread those values that kind of brought me to where I was and maybe the person I am. And, you know, all those people taught me that mentored me and my career through, you know, pararescue and um, working with you guys and every other service that I've worked with. So I think it's super awesome to have guys like you out here um, willing to just put the time in um, and talk to these people that really 
don't have the experience, but could definitely use that kind of guiding and mentorship in order to make themselves successful and, you know, further whatever they're doing, uh, because they're all applicable across everything we do. So as far as um, we always kind of ask this question, um, you know, you have a lot of things that got you through (laughs) the events that you've been through and the trials and tribulations, getting yourself and your team through different deployments and that kind of stuff um, for selection specifically, because you know that it's going to be difficult for those people that are going to selection. What advice would you give to them specifically, whether it's training, whether it's a mentality and whether it's, you know, whatever else it is, look at, look at your buddy or whatever um, to be successful during their tryouts or selection? Uh, I would say uh, one, be accountable. And then two is do the hard work early. You know, there's so many of the guys that, that I saw that were trying to take shortcuts or, or cheat early because they saw it on a Reddit or read a book or somewhere else that you always have to cheat to get through training. And that's such, such bad advice. You know, if, if you're willing to put the extra work in early, it's going to make everything else easier in the long run. You know, if you, if you think about, you know, that whole training is a ramp, you know, the more cheating you do at the beginning, it's just harder going to be to climb at the end. So I would say do the, do the hard work early and stay consistent. I think that's another that's a t-shirt to do the hard work early. Like <laughs> I get yeah, amped I know, right? say that. Oh, wait, let me write that down. <laughs> yeah, write that <laughs> yeah, down. It's, it's your intellectual property. Ball, big letters behind you. Yeah. We'll, yes, my we'll tag you. We'll tag you when we sell the shirt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know, I think that's, you know, a hundred percent correct. There's a lot of people out there and uh, I've talked to a couple that are just like, you know, I think I'm probably going to be okay because we have an entrance entrance exam called the past that you have to do. And they're like, eh, I could pretty much get by. Like, have you had somebody else look at you and your form? Have you done, you know, all the steps that are necessary in order to actually be successful? Have you looked at where you actually can be rather than just meeting the minimum? And, you know, people can lie to themselves all day, but when it comes to actually performing and you show up at selection and your teammates are, you know, surpassing you or whatever, and you fall to the wayside because all the people that actually put in the prep work are successful, you know, that's going to show and you can't hide that. Even if you, you know, as good as you are at at people may be at hiding things or, you know, scurving, trying to take shortcuts, that kind of stuff, it really shows itself at some point in time. Usually it's early on, Um, Mm -hmm. you know, some people are really good at it and they can scurve up until when it gets real, real hard and everyone points them out. By that time, the team already hates them and doesn't want to be around them. The instructors have noticed little things about their personality that's like, I don't know if I trust this guy. He's kind of sketchy. Like, make sure you watch that dude. There's just something off about him Um, because we see so many candidates go through. It's just like, you know, we can tell the guys that are really in it and their heart is hundred percent in it. And those guys that are trying to just get out of training or trying to scurve the littlest bit so they can sneak by and eventually put on the trident or beret or whatever. And you see, I mean, I've seen that a couple of times and they eventually reveal themselves and um, you know, they get, excommunicated from the team one way or another yeah i mean it's, it's funny how obvious it is when when you're on the instructor side or the cadre side you know the guys that like that that stand out like okay these guys really want to do the extra the extra work and they're asking the right questions and they're they're kind of setting an example and it's easy to help them right because they're showing it they're, they're, they want to be there they want to do the right thing so it's almost easy you know i don't mind spending extra time or a couple hours with with students that they're try to go that, that extra, you know, do the extra mile and do the extra work. Cause you know, at, at some point, you know, as much as I hate to say it, they're going to be filling my shoes and I, I'm doing my, my community and everybody else a disservice if I don't try to make them as best they possibly can for the guys that are willing to, to do the work. hundred percent. That's what I would tell the candidates is like, you're literally training to fill my shoes and work next to the guys that I have, you know, spent hours and hours on helicopters and, you know, blood next to all that other kind of stuff. So you better be prepared. I'm not going to send any shit bags to go fight with my friends or anything like that. So no, hell no. um, And then the other thing I normally don't ask, uh, you know, this question, but you have a lot of leadership experience and obviously you have a successful company trying to teach people how to become leaders and stuff like that. And we have a lot of people that are trying to go into, you know, combat rescue officers, uh, special tactics officer, all that kind of stuff. Um, From a leadership perspective, what traits differentiate a leader from a person that, you know, is coming in 
as an enlisted and not expecting to be a leader or whatever, if they want to be successful, as an officer or you know an NCO with some prior experience what advice would you give to them um, when going Ooh. through selection uh, probably the same stuff we talked you know, like your responsibility accountability uh, humility is, is huge uh, empathy for the guys you're with you know that's kind of a soft word but you know, you got to be empathetic for the guys you're working with and for but uh, you know it's kind of a yin and yang you got to be empathetic but you also have to be pretty hard with the black and white you know, here's, here's the standards, you know, as a leader, I'm going to set the standards and I'm going to ex- ex- exceed those standards because I'm, you know, I'm leading from the front. I want people to look at me and like, Hey, Master Chief may be old, but he's still kicking our ass. So it's going to draw them. You know, it, it's hard to lead from behind and push people where they need to be. It's much easier to be the leader. That's, that's setting an example and pulling people behind you into the direction you want them to go. Yeah, exactly. If they don't see that full example of what, they're, you're actually looking for, then how are they supposed to know in like a specific direction? It's, it's pretty hard to actually follow that. Um, well, well, you guys probably all know the the old Air Force guy that's like always shows up to the range, always shows up to the jump and strapping his shit on it. There's no reason that, you know, that the Sergeant Major needs to be strapping his stuff on, but there he is. He's with the guys. He's strapping on and doing the sucky jumps because that's what they do. Exactly. And that's what, you know, the guys that are coming on team. I mean, what I remember looking at my team sergeant, I was like, dang, this guy's, you know, a legend. He's been all over the place. And like, I just want this dude to teach me everything that he knows because yeah. you see him go to the range and everything is just methodic the way that he does everything. And, you know, when I was a younger guy, it's like, here I am. Like, uh, did I put my holster on correctly or <laughs> like, you know, just the little things that you just don't know until, um, you can refine them once you get onto the team and you see other guys and you just kind of format yourself to fit into that mold of what should be expected of you. And if you have a team leader or somebody that's just, you know, soup sandwich all the time and they can't get themselves together, obviously you're going to think that that is acceptable in the future. So uh, not being able to, you know, perform in that manner is definitely going to pay out a lot and yeah. negative or positive, however you view your team and how you want to do it. So I think that's a good point. Um, any last words or anything from any last shots from Trent Aaron? No, just thanks for coming on. We really appreciate it. And uh, what, where can, uh, where can everybody find you? You're involved in a lot of projects, but if people want to you know, make <laughs> sure that they're following up on your stuff and seeing what you do day to day, I know we, you've got the Instagram and, and we'll put that out, but um, is there any other project that you want to draw some attention to? Uh, probably the Instagram is a big one right now. That's, that's as much as I hate social media. That's got the most traction for, and it's easiest for me to keep up with on, on messages and stuff. So yeah, if guys have got information or, or got some questions, just hit me on that. Uh, got the Redcon one outdoor side. It's a little more, yeah. If you guys want some, some supplements or something else and get a deal, just hit me on that. And I'll, I'll I've got a special deal for the military guys, uh, percentage off. So hit me on that. And then, uh, yeah, I've got, uh, I've got a few different projects coming up. Just stay tuned. One's going to be a kind of a YouTube series, I think, kind of based off mindset and resiliency and well, just fun stuff, stuff I enjoy sharing with everybody. Outstanding. Thanks, Master Chief. We appreciate you coming on. Yeah, yeah awesome. Can't say thanks enough. And, and thanks to Everly Stock and Mike for, for linking us up. Yeah, um, here we go. Like this, this is the, the best reason to do what we're doing right now is I, I would do this podcast without anybody watching or listening just because for the opportunity to talk <laughs> yeah. to the people that we get to talk to, like it's incredible. So, well, Nikki's going to kill it. me. I didn't hit record on anything. So you did do this just to talk. To <laughs> oh, damn it. There's so much gold in there too. Yes. We got to do it again. Yeah. Oh no. <laughs> no. Yeah. Damn, Air Force guys. <laughs> I know. Right. <laughs> got you again. Yeah. No, Everly Stock is super awesome. And this is also one of their jackets. Yeah. Yeah. The hoodie, man. I love that. Yeah, stuff. The hoodie. And this is super awesome. Anyway. So we love Everly Stock. Aside from that, uh, we really appreciate you, Terry, taking the time to just come out here and talk to us Air Force folk. And, you know, the main main idea behind this entire thing and the way the, the reason that we do this podcast is to make sure that guys are as prepared as possible and that we can share that insight and experience as much as possible to get these people to be better than we ever were. And like we, like we were talking about earlier, to take our place one day and, you know, go on, continue the fight. Um, you know, obviously everybody ages out at some point, um, but we still have that mindset and we have the experience to be able to share. Um, and we're 
all very appreciative to just be able to have done all the things that we do and very appreciative to just work with people like you who are going out there mentoring guys um, and obviously have done uh, awesome service for his country and his teams. It's, you know, the bonds and the relationships that we have throughout our careers are really the things that make us to the person that who, who we are and um, allow us to give back to the communities. So, um, you know, we're talking about just to recap, we're talking about um, Terry's time and, and he joined a little while ago, but he transitioned from that point of being a pre 9 11, which is, you know, the benchmark of anybody who's been in for a while's military career because that transitioned the mindset of, okay, we're in peacetime, we're going to, you know, places like wherever, Costa Rica, that kind of place, to now we're in Afghanistan constantly getting shot at. And you heard back in uh, Terry's 2007 deployment when he was getting after it and they couldn't find enough targets for him or they were finding too many targets. He couldn't fulfill all the targets that needed to be taken care of. And almost went the other way with that. Um, but super busy um, and tons of experience with just going down a range, uh, you know, being the person in charge of the SEAL team. And then also that instructor experience where he got to, um, like I said, learn that he, his mentorship skills and hone his mentorship skills, let him into the person that he is today and the things that he's doing, um, helping mentor uh, different companies that are reaching out to him for his experience and helping them create an environment where just like on the teams, it's productive and you get the mission done. So again, we appreciate you being able to come on here and just taking the time to talk to us, talk to our listeners. Um, you know, you guys, um, you listeners out there, um, if you, you definitely need to follow his page. What was the page again on Instagram? Just for everybody. Yeah. Just Terry. Huyen. Easy. Terry. Huyen. Um, and it's okay. If people will just reach out to you, I'm sure they got tons of questions for you and everything like that to try and differentiate, you know, this whole gig between Navy, army, air force, coast guard, whoever else they're all doing awesome stuff even though we poke fun at each other all the time, yeah. um, you know, the mindset is still there. Well, I'll take the, uh, the top 10% and I'll push you guys the rest. <laughs> okay. First all right. of all, it's, it's not I what you work. said, it's how you said it. It was your tone. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I will throw this out there too. Cause so I did the, the mic drop podcast with Mike Ritland about a week or so ago. And I just kind of happened to do a kind of spur of the moment giveaway and what I asked the guys to do on the giveaway was to nominate a friend and tell us, tell me why they deserve that product. It was just a pile of different stuff I had at the house. So I kind of like this theme. I, I got a lot of really good feedback on good people saying good things about their friends. So if you guys are interested, we'll do another one of those, whenever this drops, you know, nominate a friend, tell us why you like them. And then uh, what I did with Chris on, on his podcast earlier today is like offer up a zoom call. So if you guys want to jump on a zoom call with whoever we win and if they got questions or whatever else, 20, 30 minutes of just having chit chat, I'm, I'm open to all that stuff. hundred percent. Couldn't be a, yep. couldn't be an easier yes in the world. Yep. That's, that's the easiest yes I've ever gotten to in my whole life. And we'll guilt Mike into giving us another backpack to give away. Hell yeah. <laughs> that's easy. <laughs> so many backpacks. All yeah. right. Well, thanks again, Terry, for coming on the show. And for you guys listening out there, make sure you go ahead and check out the YouTube because he's got a sick beard. And then also <laughs> Trent's hair is on point today. So you guys can vote which one is looking better today. I vote, you know, Terry's can, beard, obviously. Can you see all that? Yeah. <laughs> Look at that. Look at that. Man, that, is, that is fantastic. <laughs> yeah, Look at profile. that. Profile. Uh, all right, make sure stop. That's freedom. <laughs> Uh, make sure life. you guys leave us some comments uh, down below. You know, we're always here for you guys. So info at one's ready. You can reach us anytime and we'll get to your questions. Definitely within a week at the very least, mostly in 24 hours, depending on what's going on. Peach is a little bit out. We didn't really mention him not being here today, but he's out moving, doing a bunch of stuff right now. So unfortunately he couldn't be here. Uh, but you know, we appreciate everything. And if you can just leave us a five-star review over at Apple podcast, if you enjoy the podcast, if you're not, then tell us what we need to do to fix it because we're always open to feedback and we're always open to making this thing better and the best that we could possibly be for you guys. So go out there, earn each breath and keep training hard. Later. Later. Hey.